programs to help promote activities such as hiking, fishing, hunting, camping, and biking. All participants during the session will be muted, but you, mu you may ask questions or make comments using the chat function in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. All right, I'm getting a note here that I need to start over because um, you couldn't hear me. I'm not sure if that's the case. Okay, um, I'm sorry. I ca okay, so they can hear me now. I apologize. <laughs> um, technical difficulties. This is the Get Outdoors PA webinar, Hunt, Target, Shoot, Fish, the Wild Side of Recreation. Um, Okay, now I'm getting a note that uh, somebody else could hear me the whole time, so I'm sorry. Um, I think all of you are partners already, community partners with Get Outdoors PA, so you're already uh, familiar with the program, so I won't go through that whole spiel again. Um, but I do want to point out to you on the screen here um, about Get Outdoors PA that we do have a new flagship partner who we just added to the mix, and that is the Pennsylvania Association, um, Pennsylvania Educators, Environmental Educators Association. Uh, so we're very excited to have them involved because that's a, a great partnership for us. So back to the webinar here, protocol. All participants are muted. Uh, you can submit questions and comments in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, if you have questions, and then we will try to respond to them during the session. Um, Emily Gates, uh, our trustee technical person here from PRPS, will be um, answering questions, providing some handout information, et cetera, up, um, and links that you can copy and paste um, if you want to follow certain um, follow those links and check out certain resources that we mention. Um, but they will also be available on the partner portal of the website. Uh, this will be recorded and it will be posted um, on, the, on the partner portal again of the website. The webinar has been approved for 0.1 CEUs or one contact hour, and individuals who have purchased continuing ed credits for this webinar have to attend the live webinar and take the quiz immediately following the presentation. So with me today are uh, Andrew Desco, who's going to be going by Andy today since we have two of them on the call. He is uh, a regional edu education specialist for the Southeast region for the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Andy, do you want to say hello? Make sure you unmute yourself first. <laughs> Hello, everybody. There he is. Thanks a lot, Andy. Uh, we also have Andrew Huser, who is the Hunting Education Administrator for the Pennsylvania G Game Commission. Andrew, you want to say hi? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Great. Thanks. And then we also have Todd Holmes, who is the Shooting Sports Outreach Coordinator for the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Todd, you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. Glad to have you with us. Thank you, gentlemen. And as I said, Emily Gates from PRPS on the technical side um, today. So just to give you a little background, uh, Andy Desco is, um, and it has been in this position for over seven years with the Fish and Boat Commission. He obtained his Associates of Applied Sciences from Butler County Community College in Parks and Recreation Management and his Bachelor's from Slippery Rock University in Parks and Resource Management. He enjoys what free time he has with his wife and baby boy, and occasionally gets the opportunity to hunt, fish, paddle, hike, and camp. Andrew Huser is the environmental, the hunting education administrator for the state of Pennsylvania. He's originally from New York. He's a graduate of SUNY Brockport with degrees in environmental science and criminal justice. And before joining the Game Commission in 2013, he did extensive work for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation summer camps programs. Uh, he also coordinated hunter education and 
shooting sports programs for Camp Pack Forest and Camp Colby in the Adirondacks. He was a lucky guy. And in addition, he um, also ran the Hunter Trapper Education Program. He's also the Deputy Wildlife Conservation Officer for the Game Commission. And finally, we've got Todd Holmes, who has over 25 years of experience in hunting and shooting competitively. He holds a Bachelor's in Parks and Recreation Management from Frostburg State University, and he manages the National Archery in the Schools program for the state of Pennsylvania, which includes, as he will tell you during the webinar, over 225 schools, and it encompasses over 60,000 students each year. He is a certified basic archery instructor training specialist, as well as a USA Archery Level 3 National Training Systems coach. And he, when he has a little free time, enjoys fly fishing, hunting, and being a father to two little boys and spending time with his family outdoors. So our goals for today is that we want to provide tools to you as partners to connect you to outdoor recreation education, to state-level resources, and um, to help provide you with incentive to offer opportunities for archery, hunters, education, uh, and fishing. National Hunting and Fishing Day prevents an opportunity in late September to make that connection. And so we want to provide you with um, a little bit of information to help uh, so you'll consider potentially offering a program. If not this year, then maybe next year. So this year, as I said, um, Get Outdoors PA selects is selecting four different um, events to focus on, and one of them, the third for the year, is the National Hunting and Fishing Day, and uh, we're focusing those, that day focuses on target shooting, hunting, and fishing. This year, that day is September the 24th, which is a Saturday, and it's pretty exciting to see that this, this National Hunting and Fishing Day was born. The idea was born in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania in the early 1970s from a shop owner who said that after decades that sportsmen had spent supporting conservation and wildlife management through volunteerism and financial contributions via fishing and hunting licenses, it was uh, time to designate a special day to to acknowledge them. The day became official with the signing of a proclamation by President Nixon in 1972, and I have his little quote there. I urge all citizens to join with outdoor sportsmen in the wise use of our natural resources and in ensuring their proper management for the benefit of future generations. And I think it's important to realize that um, that really this movement and a leader early on was President Theodore Roosevelt. And he was a sportsman, so um, it's really important to, to thank the sportsmen and, and give them some great opportunities because they're really important for conservation and environmental movement today. So we're going to start with uh, Todd Holmes, and he's going to talk about shooting sports programs in Pennsylvania. So go ahead, Todd. Okay, good afternoon everybody. As Samantha mentioned, my name is Todd Holmes. I'm from the Pennsylvania Game Commission and I'm in charge of the shooting sports programs that we offer here in the state of PA. Uh, so we're going to do a brief overview of a couple of the programs that we offer. Uh, primarily we are focused in archery right now as that's much e easier to get into some of our schools and get access to our students with archery equipment as opposed to firearms as you might uh, guess. Uh, let's see if we can, there we go. Okay, um, so the first one we're going to talk about is the National Archery in the Schools program. This program was started in 2005 by the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Um, currently, as Samantha mentioned earlier, we have 225 plus schools that are enrolled in this program. Uh, it's a beginner entry level program for students to learn how to safely and effectively shoot a bow. Um, it's typically taught in a PE class. Um, during the school day, so every student gets an opportunity to participate. Um, each school that joins the program is trained by a state certified trainer that I certify myself. Um, they, will, they will travel to the school and they will train the teachers, uh, volunteers, teachers aides, even parents 
um, that may want to attend the training free of charge um, and make sure that when they walk out of there they have a complete understanding on how to run the training, how to teach the students the process of shooting a bow and doing it safely. Uh, the Game Commission currently offers $1,500 grants to any new school that joins the NAS program. Uh, we do this through Pittman and Robertson dollars, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but an equipment kit roughly costs around $3,000, so we try to cut that price down so it helps any new school join the program by offering those $1,500 grants. During certain times of the year, we even have more grant funding than that. There's times where I may be able to get $2,000 for a new school or even more possibly. So uh, the only way to really know is to contact me through email or through Facebook and we can see how much money we can come up with any new school that wants to join. Now I'll remind you this is a school specific program so it may not cater to um, a Parks and Rec Department but I'll tie that into how this can help you later on here in a minute. Um, so if you're interested in finding a training about the NAS program you can visit our website on our home page we have an education tab and you'll find the National Archery in the Schools program listed underneath of that. If you click on that there's an events calendar and all of our trainings are posted there. As I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of schools that have joined in the last five or six years. Uh, we're pushing 60,000 students each year that interact with archery equipment in our schools, which is a tremendous number. Uh, the NAS program nationally actually has 2.25 million students in the United States that participate, which to put it in perspective with another sport uh, is now larger than Little League Baseball. So this program is uh, growing very rapidly and it's very successful across the nation. Uh, and part of that reason is archery is one of the safest high school sports offered. Statistically there's no sport safer except for table tennis, which I always thought was kind of funny uh, because you wouldn't associate a lot of injuries with table tennis or ping pong. Um, but teachers are also seeing student attendance, participation, self-esteem, and investment in class activities increased with the NAS, pre the NAS program present in school. Uh, so kids aren't wanting to miss archery class or archery practice. Um, they're not calling off sick or not showing up to class. They want to go. They want to participate. So they're seeing some really productive um, attributes to the program. Todd, okay. can yeah. I, um, since you're talking about the, the schools, and we just had a question um, as to whether a non-traditional environmental education center that holds school programs would be eligible for um, for funding through this program. A non-traditional environmental education center that holds school programs would be eligible. I would say that, it's, that it would be the responsibility of the school to obtain the equipment because we can't provide grant funding unless you are a school. Um, so if the school had the equipment, had obtained the equipment, and they wanted to hold the programming at your environmental education center, and that's completely up to the school by all means. They can share the kit. Uh, they can hold programmings outside of school. Um, as long as they're teaching the NAS curriculum, absolutely they'd be able to, to do that. Okay, great. That's, that's good information for other park and recreation departments, too, because that, that could be a partnership that even municipal entities could could do with the schools. Absolutely. And, and another thing that I can mention there is sometimes schools have a hard time coming up with the remaining $1,500 for funding a kit. So if an environmental center or community center help fund the remainder of that kit, they may be more willing to let you borrow the equipment or run programming at your center as well. So That's a great idea. Thanks. Sure. Okay, so the funding for the NAS program, as I mentioned earlier, uh, comes from the Pittman and Robertson Act and not, not everybody knows what that is, so I'll go into a little bit of detail with that. Uh, it was an act approved by Congress in 1937. It places an excise tax on specific items such as firearms, ammunition, archery equipment. Um, so every time that an individual goes to a store and purchases, say, a bow and arrow, they're going to pay an 11% sales tax that is deposited into a federal fund or account, um, and that money is collected from all states, all 50 states, and then it's allocated to those states at the end of the year based off of a percentage of their hunting license purchases and their total land mass. So Pennsylvania is a fairly large state uh, with our land mass, and we also have a ton of hunters, so we get a quite large sum of money every year from PR dollars. Uh, and those monies are used for restoration habitat management on 
our state, uh, state game lands, as well as funding hunter education and shooter education for our state. So NAS falls under shooter education, so all the funding for this program um, comes from the sale of firearms, ammunition, and archery equipment. Okay, so the way that this ties into a program that you may be able to use in your community center or rec center or state park um, is the NASP training is considered a basic archery instruction, um, and that's the certification you'll get when you take a NASP training. So say that your local school has the NASP program and you attend their, their training for free. When you come out of there, you'll be a certified basic archery instructor. What that does for you is that coordinates with USA Archery's program, Explore Archery where you're required to be a level one USA Archery instructor. USA Archery recognizes NAS certifications as well. So then you'll be certified to teach and explore archery program in your community center or state park or whatever uh, it may be. So the Explore Archery program is a program that you can get into a state park or a community center. It works extremely well with different ages and different ethnicities and, and groups of people that have never been experienced to hunting or the sport of archery. Um, it's based off of an introductory level course where we simply teach individuals how to safely and effectively shoot a bow, similar to NASP, but it incorporates 30 activities that are fun for the students or participants, and it just gets everybody interacting with one another. Um, it's a very uh, lending program to a community center where you can offer kind of like a fun day, um, and it's not all serious and, and by the book and you're, you're just simply going through the steps of how to shoot a bow. So as you can see in the picture there, there's lots of games uh, that are involved with it. And another thing that it does is it gets families together and they can all shoot at the same time. So parents, kids, aunts, uncles, grandparents, everyone can participate as well. Um, all the equipment for the Explore Archery program was funded through a grant. We actually have 15 state parks in Pennsylvania that now have this equipment kit. Uh, at, at their location and they're beginning to offer the Explore Archery programming right now, actually probably as we speak. Um, so some of the kits went out last week, some of them were sent out in December. But there are 15 locations now across the state that are going to be using uh, the Explore Archery equipment kits. So here's a list of the state parks that have equipment now. I'm not going to read through all of them, but they're there if you want to look them up. You may recognize some of those. Um, that are close to your location or maybe you've heard of them so you can take a peek at Google and see how far these locations are from you and maybe you'd be able to use some of their equipment or take some of the, your kids or participants in your programs to one of their um, one of their events. So that's a, a great resource to have with the state park right down the road. They may be able to provide you uh, with some programming that's going to be less intrusive of you setting it up yourself, but you'll be able to, to enjoy it as well. And Todd, how much um, are one of those kits and what do they include? So if anybody was interested in purchasing a kit, um, which, is eligible, which would be an eligible uh, mini-grant application, by the way, through the Get Outdoors PA program. Absolutely. Uh, the kits run about $3,200 to $2,800. It depends on the type of bow that you choose. Um, and the nice thing about this program is you can shoot recurve or compound bows. Um, and depending, you can get a half and half kit. So you have half compound bows, half recurve, or you can get all compound or you can get all recurve. Um, so depending on which way you go there, it changes the price a little bit, but it's normally $100 or $200 um, you know, within each other. Um, so, and the kits are ordered all through usaarchery.org. Um, you'll go onto their webpage. They have the equipment listed there in a kit, so you can buy the entire kit. You can also buy the curriculum book there as well. So everything you really need to run this program, you can purchase from USA Archery. Um, and if you have your level one USA Archery training or a basic archery instructor training, you're certified to teach this course. Um, they do require that though to run the course and to buy the curriculum book and equipment. You have to provide proof of your certification before they'll send it to you. So in order, if you are, um, uh, Kate King is asking if a community center could buy a kit. So the community center could buy a kit, but before they would send the kit to you, somebody affiliated with them has to have the certification? Exactly. Yep. So if they would find 
Um, and here's the other resource we'll give you. If you go to the USA Archery website, uh, you can click on Find a Training. Uh, there's in the calendar that's listed that shows all the trainings across the United States and what level training they are. So they go from level one to level five. You only need a level one to teach this course. Um, so you can select that you're only searching for level ones and then you can pick, say, the state of Pennsylvania. And it'll bring up a calendar of all the level one courses that are offered here in our state and the locations, date, time, etc. cetera. Um, and then you can register for the course right there. Uh, price varies from time to time depending on who's putting it on. Sometimes it's $40, sometimes it's $100. Um, it just depends on the, who's hosting the event. Um, but that's the way that you can get certified. Or, as I mentioned earlier, you can attend a National Archery in the Schools program training, which they're spread out across the state. And you can find that calendar on the PGC website, as I mentioned earlier. So there's two different ways to get certified. And once you have that certification, any community center, uh, is eligible, eligible to purchase the kit then. Okay. Um, and, and if you see uh, to all the participants the um, information uh, Emily put on there, the USA Archery link, um, the certification and clinics, and uh, the, the many grants that Get Outdoors PA offers, um, there will be another one that will launch either the end of 2016 or into, the, into early 2017 for anyone who's a community partner um, or has become a community partner by now. Uh, you can apply. The mini grants are around 25 There, You can apply for up to $2,500, and that um, you can apply for funding for equipment or training. Um, but you do need to have a 50% match. So you could, um, you could use that match and then apply for the money, and that could go towards paying for the kit as well as um, any training expenses. So uh, that's some information about that. Thanks a lot, Todd. We have your information up there um, if somebody wants any more information on that. And next we're going to move to Andrew Andrew Huser, who's going to talk about hunter trapper education. Awesome, thank you, Samantha, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Again, um, my name is Andy Huser. I'm the hunter education administrator for the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Um, I'll just run through some quick highlights of the program. Um, unlike a lot of the other programs that we're talking about today, hunter trapper education in Pennsylvania is a mandatory program. So, if you want to hunt in Pennsylvania or really any other state that requires a hunter education certificate, you have to take our course. Um, and the main tenets of our course and what it's designed to do is to produce safe, and there's an emphasis on safety, responsible, knowledgeable, and involved hunters. Um, just like the NASP program that Todd runs, uh, we operate off the same grant. We are both entirely funded by Pittman Robertson money. So it is sportsmen and women that are, that are really paying the bill for these programs. Um, our Hunter Ed program in Pennsylvania has been around for a very long time. It started in 1959. Uh, at that point, it was a voluntary program that was run by the NRA. Several years later, the Game Commission took control of the program, and we've been running it ever since. Uh, we usually certify almost 40,000 students every year through this program um, over the course of history. Uh, last year, we celebrated our 2 millionth hunter education student graduate. Uh, we just had the student come into our commission meeting yesterday, and we recognized him with some really cool handouts. But it's a, it's a huge program. Um, there is a lot of community demand for this. So I know if we have uh, community partners that are here on this webinar, um, there is definitely going to be a lot of demand for this program in your community. and If it's not being met, this is an excellent opportunity for you to get involved. Um, we are part of an organization called the International Hunter Education Association. And basically what that, program, that uh, organization does is it establishes the standards that our Hunter Ed program needs to meet. And because we meet that standard, a Hunter Education Certificate that you get in Pennsylvania when you complete our course is good for you to go to any other state in the United States, any Canadian province, and the entire country of Mexico, and buy a hunting license there. So we have reciprocity with all of those states as well. So if, if you would like to also hunt out of state, uh, you need to take our program, um, and, and that's a, a great service to offer as well. So primarily our goal 
is to reduce the number of hunting-related shooting incidents, or HRSIs. Um, back in the day, uh, when we're talking about you know, the days before hunter education, uh, 1915, the 1920s, uh, it was pretty routine to have hundreds and hundreds of injuries because of careless firearm handling um, in, in our hunting public. And at some point, someone sat down and said, we really need to figure out a way to address this. So eventually, the program became mandatory. We decided that education was the way to get it done. Uh, the program became mandatory for all first-time licensed buyers in 1982. Uh, so before that, it was only first-time licensed buyers under 16, and before that, it didn't even exist. So 1982 is when it became mandatory for all first-time licensed buyers. And since that time, HRSIs, or hunting-related shooting incidents, have decreased by more than 85%. And that is something that the Game Commission tracks very closely. So as you can see here on the graph, um, this is the number of HRSIs in Pennsylvania since 1980. Um, and if you look back in 1980, we had over 200 incidents in a single calendar year. And fast forward to last year, 2015, we had our safest year of hunting in Pennsylvania ever. Uh, we only had 23 HRSIs total although unfortunately we did have one fatality. So um, even one is too many, and we say that every year, but uh, the more we work towards this program, the, the more resources that we pour into it, uh, the closer we get to having a, a zero injury and zero fatality year in Pennsylvania. So I guess to answer the question on the top of that, does it work? Yeah, it does work, and education has been tremendous uh, in reducing the number of accidents and, and incidents that we have out there. So. To answer some questions, I guess, before they even come up from, from uh, the municipalities that are out there, um, there's over a 1,000 courses that we teach every year. They are, for the most part, completely run by volunteer instructors. We have over 2,000 of them. Uh, the volunteer teams are overseen by uh, local wildlife conservation officers. Usually there's two, sometimes three, sometimes only one per county, and they oversee all of the hunter education that happens in that county. Um, if, you would like to become involved. Uh, there's some information up there on how you can request an instructor application, uh, especially for um, you know county rec departments, stuff like that. Um, I highly recommend getting your staff certified to teach a hunter education course. But the other option that you have is you can simply open up your venue to allow some of our volunteers to teach there if they're not already teaching there. Um, and the way to do that would be to contact your uh, local game commission regional office, depending on what region you are in, and they will put you in touch with your local conservation officer who can reach out to the volunteers and, and talk about scheduling a course there. But like I said, there's, there's a tremendous amount of community demand for this. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have already gotten calls saying, I want to take Hunter Ed, how do I do that? Um, but it's pretty simple. You can see all the courses that are offered in your area. If you go onto the Game Commission webpage under Hunter Education, our entire course calendar page is posted. You can search by zip code and find courses that are close by. Um, or for a date that works for you. And last year, we did just add another facet uh, to the program. We are now offering the Hunter Education course completely online for individuals who are 16 years of age or older. Uh, but there is a fee for that program. If you take it online, it's $19.50. If you take the course in person, it remains free, and that obviously the in-person course is open to everybody. So that was that was a question that I had, Andy, was if a municipal park and rec or an environmental ed center were to partner with you in offering uh, a hunter education program, then it would be free? Yes. Okay. Yes, completely. Okay. okay. Um, and in terms of if, if people are interested in opening facilities, uh, the needs of the program to run in a facility are pretty limited. Really, we only need a classroom space. Um, there is no live fire requirement, so we don't require you to have a shooting range or anything like that. Um, as long as it's a handicap accessible facility um, and there's a nice quiet space for teaching, really we, we teach this course in all sorts of different venues, so we're pretty flexible there. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, if, if anybody has any questions uh, for him and they want to chat them, um, we, can, we can deal with them, or you can wait until the end and, and ask questions as well. Um, for right now, we'll move on to Andy Desco, who's going to talk about fishing. OK, thank you, Samantha. Yes, uh, so 
just to reintroduce myself, I'm Andy Desco, the Southeast Region Education Specialist with Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. So my area of coverage, uh, my office is based in Bucks County. Uh, I cover the Lehigh Valley, Reading, Lancaster, back to Philly, and fill in all the other counties in between the 10-county region. So uh, I might not be the local contact for some people on the uh, webinar, but I can get you in touch with one of my counterparts for your region uh, for any of the programs that I'm going to be mentioning here. Uh, I kind of would get, a, get on my soapbox for uh, the beginning of the presentation on my first slide here. Uh, just to mention that um, there's a lot of myths set out there about who needs a license and uh, when it's required. And so I just want to stress that uh, you do not need a fishing license. No one fishing in Pennsylvania needs a license until age 16. And my second bullet on the first slide here is that I, I do get a lot of people that come up to me at shows, different venues, or we're out you know, talking to the public, and they say, well, I don't need a fishing license because I just release everything I catch. And I will stress that for those of us 16 and older, the fishing license is required even when we're catch and release fishing. Okay, um, for people who are, are in your areas that are mentioning an interest in fishing, uh, maybe they're not ready to make the leap and buy a fishing license, we do have fish for two fish for free days each year, and we have passed those for this season. In uh, 2016, those were determined to be Sunday, May 29th, and on the 4th of July. Uh, those are determined by our executive director, and um, as he determines, he might change those dates. Sometimes it's a date uh, like Labor Day. So you kind of have to keep your eyes open at the beginning of each year to see what those two fish for free days are going to be. <clears throat> um, it is important for people to buy their fishing license because that, that does really support our agency. Funding from fishing license sales goes directly back to our agency um, for aquatic education programming to go back to the resource uh, so that we can provide better fishing opportunities to, to the public of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm going to jump back and just talk about uh, where, where Todd mentioned the Pittman-Robertson Act. On the fishing side of things, we also have a Dingle and Johnson Act from 1950. There's a tax on fishing equipment and uh, is later dubbed the Sport Fish Restoration Act. And uh, so anytime someone goes out and purchases fishing equipment or boating equipment, there is a tax, that federal tax, that uh, my agency gets a portion of that helps us for our aquatic educational programming as well. All right, and still talking about those fishing license sales on my next slide here. Um, we, we are in a big push with programming to, to get people interested in fishing. Uh, in 1990 was kind of our big spike uh, where we reached 1.16 million license buyers in Pennsylvania. And since then, those numbers have dropped. Uh, in 2014, we had 850,000 uh, fishing licenses sold. So although the population of Pennsylvania is growing, we are seeing a declining trend in licensed buyers. Since uh, there is a, a pretty obvious blob of yellow on this slide, that time frame from 1964 to 1973 was called Operation Bootstrap. And you can go onto our website, www.fishandboat.com. It's going to be brought up on a slide later in the presentation. But um, we had a, a big dip in license sales in 1964, and there was a, a large effort from our agency then. Uh, staff were cut. It was a, a by the name bootstrap. It was a boots on the ground type operation, knocking on doors, getting people interested in fishing again. That led to that big spike back up to 1973. All right, and one of our uh, big resources, one of our that we provide, that we can provide to nature centers, state parks, community parks, is our fishing tackle loaner program. Uh, this program, if you sign up for it and apply through our agency, we can provide you with fishing equipment uh, that you can uh, provide to local residents. It basically turns your site into a fishing rod library, if you will. The family can come to your site uh, sign out the equipment for the day, uh, or if you want to do an extended loan, that's that's up to your site. And uh, 
you can allow that family to go fish at to some local venues. It's really uh, great if you have a lake or stream right on your property. Um, but the, the Fishing Tackle Loaner Program, is that's where I tie in that Sport Fish Restoration Act that my agency gets the money. We purchase the equipment, and if you are apply and are, are granted to be part of the Tackle Loaner Program, then we provide you with uh, fishing rods, the reels, they're going to be pre-spooled with line, ready to go, and we're going to have the terminal tackle for you, being the bobbers, hooks, and that equipment. All right, so we have from this slide, you can see the 60 sites that are currently on there. So if you're not personally interested in signing up for, for your, uh, your property for a site, uh, you can see the sites that are already in existence, many state parks, uh, YMCA's, other groups like that. The one uh, caveat I'll say to the, the fishing tackle loaner program sites are that uh, they, you can't just use this equipment exclusively for a summer camp situation. Uh, when we do have the loaner program sites, we want them to uh, be open to the public and you have some public hours where anyone can come in and, and sign out the equipment. It can't just be reserved for special groups coming to your site. Andy, there was, uh, there was a question, um, I think it was regarding the sales of fishing licenses as to whether or not the multi-year license had any impact on sales. Uh, when, uh, yeah, great question. Um, it, it would affect individual year sales, but um, I'd, I'd actually have to look at the, I'd have to talk to um, some of our administrative staff on that because the, the monies for, for each year of uh, a license, even though someone's buying a five-year license, we're not getting all of that uh, money up front. Um, it's actually divvied out into to each year's budget. Um, so I need to see if the fishing license sales are, are considered uh, are divvied up that way too when they're when they're counting. Yeah, thanks. It was just it wasn't a big question. It was just curiosity. So. Yep. And that's one I can can look into. Uh, on my slide here with our some of the resources we provide, uh, I talked about the fishing tackle loaner program. We also provide fishing skills instructor training, uh, and that can allow if you have local staff, I'm talking to anybody out there that has uh, educational staff on their property, we, we do fishing skills instructor training, and they can lead our fishing family fishing programs that our agencies develop the curriculum for. Uh, fishing skills instructor training is free if I were coming out or one of my counterparts for your local region, we're coming out to deliver that training, it's free of charge, and um, that allows you to, to deliver our programs. I'm going to get into the benefits of, of why I'd want to run one of our family fishing programs um, over designing your own program in the, in the next couple slides. And another resource out there that we offer is our educational resources catalog that's available on our website. So as we're looking to have National Hunting and Fishing Day come up here in September, uh, you can go on to our website, get into that catalog, and order a lot of our free materials that you can have it. If you're going to have a, a fishing derby, uh, looking to host something like that, uh, any other uh, open house type activity where you'd want to have some of our literature on hand. Okay. Uh, some other resources that we have is is uh, our advertising of our fishing programs. If you want to go on our website, you're going to have a derby uh, or fishing, sometimes they're called fishing rodeos. You can go through our site, register that up on our calendar. That's even if it's just your program. It doesn't have to be one of our designated official family fishing programs. You can use our site to advertise that through our web calendar. And then that also gives us the ability to uh, advertise those programs through our social media efforts. Um, I'm one of our administrators for the face, our Facebook page and our Twitter accounts. Uh, we're getting into Instagram now. So uh, we can uh, 
have those resources. If, if we know it's happening, then we can help advertise it. Um, one of the important um, aspects, if you're going to run a fishing program that you want to open up to adults, and if you want to offer the opportunity for them to not need a fishing license, so aside from those two fish for free days I've already mentioned, you can get an application for our 2709E educational fishing license exemption. That allows people to um, sign up for a educational fishing program to uh, all your adult participants, 16 and older, can get the fishing license waiver during the time of the program. So if I'm running my, one of my family fishing programs, that's one that's uh, applicable for the 2709E. You can get the uh, educational license, fishing license waiver and then everyone gets to fish uh, for that experience up until, like I said, it's a 9 to 1 program. At 1 o'clock, the exemption dissolves. I like to jokingly call it a Cinderella license. It disappears at the end of your program, and then uh, you can tell your participants they want to continue to fish. They can go purchase their fishing license. Now you can uh, get it on your home computer and print it, print it right from home, so you don't even have to go out and find that tackle shop to get your license. Uh, another permit that people should be aware of, if you are going to run a fishing, what we call a fishing derby, and um, the description of those derbies, if it's 10 or more children organized in a fishing event, uh, we, you do need to do a PFBC 500 permit that goes through our Bureau of Law Enforcement um, so that they're aware of group organized fishing activities. So that is separate from the uh, educational fishing license exemption. That has nothing to do with waiving a fishing license. That's just if you're having a large organized group, you need to do that PFBC 500. If it is an educational fishing program and you've uh, completed the 2709, we've given you the fishing license waiver, law enforcement uh, is also aware of those programs. So you, you don't need to do both if you're doing an educational program. They, just by you sending in your application, um, we process it, and then the Bureau of Law Enforcement is aware of that program happening as well. While we're on this slide, I'll do a little advertising for us. I have the Pennsylvania Fishing License button in the lower left-hand corner. Um, just for Jeopardy <laughs> questions out there, our fishing license buttons were sold from 1923. That was the fishing license printed on a uh, hard tin button and we ran that program up until 1960 and it just became too expensive to produce metal buttons as the license. Um, they had a short run in 1974 to 75. We brought them back again, uh, tried it, it's still cost prohibitive and so uh, but a lot of people love the license buttons and so for the nostalgia of it, we as a collector's item, we brought back the buttons in 2014 and they are not a necessary item. You still buy your paper fishing license, but then if you're interested in having the button as a collector's item, you can purchase that for additional fee. And uh, the button is cool in that it works as your, to meet your display requirement. In Pennsylvania, you have to display your fishing license. And so you can have the button on your hat or on your vest and keep your paper license tucked away when you're displaying that. So uh, we started in 2014 and tying it into social media, we actually used a Facebook survey and let people pick the colors. So we've used blue, pink, and this year the brook trout pattern won out. Okay, I want to focus a little bit on our family fishing program model. We run a four hour program uh, and we start out with talking a little bit about fishing ethics. Um, and we, with those ethics, we're talking about safety manners for the water, the fish, and the property, and uh, for how to release some of the catch, and also to teach other people to be uh, ethical anglers. And we want people to attend as a family. It's uh, important. We have research that shows that having a mentor, and the, uh, the definition of family is changing. A mentor can be an uncle, a grandparent, uh, that's out there trying to get the, the youth and their family involved in the sports they love. So we uh, allow the fishing license exemption during those programs because we, we want to get uh, 
the older generations tied into the younger generations. So they're sharing the activity together. All right, our family fishing program allows someone to get the 2709E educational exemption, um, and that ties into being a fishing skills instructor. Once you are trained as a fishing skills instructor through us, then you can use our materials to run family fishing programs. Uh, we have different hands-on skills that we run uh, on the top picture there. Yeah, have an older family member showing a younger family member uh, how to tie a knot. So we cover some basic skills so that people can get interested in the sport, dip their toes in the water, so to speak, um, just so we can uh, recruit, retain, and uh, reactivate some different anglers out there. All right, after they get through the class, so the, the lecture and the skills-based training takes about an hour, then we give them the fishing opportunity. Uh, we're at a local spot where we, we hope that they can catch fish from the shoreline, get them interested in it. And my last little note there, we did a responsive management study. Uh, they were a separate independent agency uh, from 2011 to 2013. We had people who registered through our programs uh, opt to be in a survey, and we actually collected some data from them to try and understand how successful the programs really are. We uh, did a report card on, us, on ourselves to see what our family fishing programs were accomplishing. And in 2008, moving and beyond, we have an automated license system. And so by having that data from 2008 on, we're able to, to pull that data, uh, compare our sample size from our surveys, and actually understand who's attending our program that has we maybe never purchased the license before, at least not since 2008. And um, we were able to track who bought a license uh, because they attended one of our programs. So we we're, were able to try and see our success rate there. And uh, what we found is that 70% from a sample size of 1,150 people that attended programs from 11 to 2013, 70% had never purchased the license, at least going back to 2008. And 10% of our program participants had purchased the license within a year of attending their program. Uh, you know, with 10%, to try and understand what that means for success rate, we once did uh, a mailer to try and reactivate anglers, you know, just sending out postcards to, a, to an area to get people to buy their license, and that had a 1% success rate, or 1% to 3% success rate. All right, with our R3 model, we want to recruit new anglers with our family fishing programs, like the three young ladies there, get new people interested in the sport. Um, we're looking to retain our anglers, the so people who have maybe moved into Pennsylvania from other states, uh, where they only fish salt water, they're learning, learning fresh water, uh, works kept them busy for a couple of years, but now the kids are old enough, big enough, they're interested in fishing. And we also want to reactivate anglers that haven't fished in some time. What I, what I personally, my anecdotal evidence from that is uh, when grandma and grandpa show up and they want to get the, the grandkids interested in fishing, but they may have not fished in five plus years. All right. Uh, when we did some survey questions uh, to our participants about what their motivations were for coming to a family fishing program, you don't see catch fish on there, uh, not specifically. Their motivations were to be together, to be outside, uh, learn a skill in the sport together, or to polish those skills for those people that are we're reactivating. All right, our target audience with these family fishing programs, or we consider a non, someone who considers themselves a non-angler, never fished, have no experience with it. Um, former anglers, somebody who has um, what we call a returning, they haven't purchased in five plus years, those lapsed anglers, because we, we have a lot of anglers who purchase a license only every three to five years, and even those occasional anglers, because we have many anglers who, who don't buy the license every year. Um, they're only buying one license within a three to five year period. Uh, different from someone like myself who, who is already 
a trapped audience. Uh, I, I know that I love fishing. I know I'm going to buy my license every year. But our efforts are to try and get those occasional lapsed anglers back into the fold, and as well as their youth in the household. All right. Uh, for any questions, uh, my contact information is going to be at the very end if you're uh, self-motivated to go on and find out who your local education specialist is. You can go right through our website there at fishandboat.com. That's our general website. It has information on habitat, fisheries, the non-game animals that we protect, being amphibians, reptiles. So it's, it's our general website. Uh, it has information even on the boating rules and regulations. With the gonefishingpa.com site, the second one there, it is fishing specific related information that if you could help advertise, if, it's, if you have a family that's new to fishing, that site is going to have information just for them, where they can buy a license or for them to go online and buy a license, um, how to buy a fishing license button, some of our other, uh, we have shirts and hats, things like that they can purchase through that site, and um, some of our best fishing waters that are local to them where they can go out and find good spots that are local to them to get interested in the sport. So it's, it's whittled down, it's very specific to just fishing. That's a second site for that. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Andy. Um, I just wanted to mention that maybe a good opportunity for uh, one of our partners to find out how one of these programs works, or particularly like the family fishing program, um, you could participate in one. Find one at a state park or something in your area and participate and then you can see how it works and then that would be a good way to to kind of move that along um, so and and again that could work for any of these programs we're talking about so potential projects um, some of the ideas and I'll ask each of our speakers as well if one of our partners said I want to do something this year for the September 24th period of time, um, what would be a doable program to organize at this point? And is there equipment available for any of these programs, either for um, the archery programs with those kits or fishing programs? Um, can I have some, some weigh-in from our speakers as to what might be doable for this year? that again. I, I caught the uh, the back end of what you're asking. <laughs> um, what I was what I was saying is, if somebody wants to offer a program this year, this September, um, what seems like it would be realistic in terms of time out, um, you know, and and being at the ease of getting equipment, um, something that would be easy to put together in this period of time. Um, if you're looking to get it done by September, my suggestion would be par partner with somebody that has the equipment already and maybe the staff to, to run an archery program speaking for archery specifically. Um, that's kind of a tight guideline or timeline to get the equipment in your hands and have somebody trained. Um, if you have somebody trained already, it, I'd say it's possible for sure to get the equipment and have everything ready to roll by then. Um, but you also have to have the, the funding to do it as well. So. Maybe partnering is uh, probably one of the best methods, especially now that we have those 15 state parks that have those kits out there. Uh, you may be able to, like I said, use their resource or use them as a resource um, or share the equipment or, or however you may be able to work something out. But that would be my suggestion uh, because you're kind of limited here with a month or two of time to put things in place. Okay. And our Explore Archery programs typically um – like a couple hours or a day or a couple of days? So the, the great thing about that program is you can custom tailor it to exactly what you want it to be. Um, if you're doing a single day event, you can make it a two or three eight, or you can make it six hours if you want to, although that's an awful lot for a lot of people. Um, or you can break it up into if you do a week-long camp, so a lot of summer camps use this program and you can have two or three activities a day, and you can kind of increase the difficulty 
uh, of the activities that you're choosing as the week goes on. And towards the end of the week, the kids are learning some mastery skills on how to shoot a bow as opposed to the beginning, uh, you know, just starting out. So you can kind of contour the program to how you, you know, feel it needs to be um, to effectively, you know, reach the, the audience that you're working with. Okay. That's a good, that's a good point. Um, and then in terms of the hunter education courses, um, is there anything that you can suggest, uh, and Andy, Andrew, um, is there a certain season that hunter ed courses are being offered? Sure. Uh, we, we typically offer them throughout the entire year, um, although right now we're, we're in the busy season for us as far as classes go. But if you wanted to host one in September, uh, particularly on National Hunting and Fishing Day, that is a great time frame to fill courses up. Uh, as I'm sure a lot of you know, people in all facets of life wait until the very last minute. So we've been offering a lot of hunter education courses in the fall. Um, September's a great time, and you have plenty of time to get in touch with the region office and get some volunteer instructors to teach a course at your venue. Uh, that should not be a problem at all. Okay. All righty. Um, anybody else have anything that they would like to add or provide questions? I'm not sure if, if all of you or some of you can hear us. Um, I got a chat from one of our participants that said that he's not able to hear us. So I'm not quite sure what's happening with that. But um, nevertheless, here is information um, on the National Hunting and Fishing Day. Uh, there's our direct. There's the Director of Conservation Programs, and that that day is now housed under an organization called America's Wildlife Museum and Aquarium, and they're in Springfield, uh, Missouri. And there is their website and phone number. So they have um, a really nice website and some some good resources on there. Uh, and then finally, thank you to our speakers, Andrew, Andrew, and Todd from the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, the Pennsylvania Game Commission. We really appreciate your time. Uh, we didn't think we'd have you all here today, but we were lucky, and, and we did. So um, make sure that you check with them if you have other questions. Um, be sure to go to the partner portal um, for information. Uh, we continue to update it with with more up-to-date resources. Uh, we do have one more webinar scheduled um, to, uh, to offer some kind of a birding event to coincide with the Christmas bird count. So we're looking to offer that in the fall. So my contact information is there as well. You can contact us. Our email is info at getoutdoorspa.org. Our website is getoutdoorspa.org. And if you need to do the continuing education credits, uh, make sure you click on the link and uh, provide us. Please provide us with, with input. Um, we really want to provide you with hands-on information so that we can help you to feel more comfortable in offering Get Outdoors PA-oriented activities and programs. So thanks very much for being on the call today. We really appreciate it, and enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Take care. Thanks for supporting Get Outdoors PA. Bye-bye.